Let's take a look at this. South Africa announced its first case of monkeypox on Thursday. The National Health Laboratory Services, Professor Kolega Mlisana, says on the cases the, that already exist globally, they've been found mainly in men who have sex with other men. The statement, now, was this communication fair given the statistical research or was it reckless? More on this, we're joined by the acting co-executive director at Iranti, Nolwazi Tusini. Nolwazi, thank you so much for joining us this morning. It does seem that we haven't learned uh, our lessons from COVID-19 and the language used uh, with regards to that pathogen outbreak and the stigmatization that came from that. All right. We just want to play a quick bite, uh, Nolwazi, before you respond to that question of Professor Kolega Mlisana. Let's take a listen. Why are we talking about men who have sex with men? It is because, you know, um, it, it has always been endemic in Central and Northern Africa. But lately, there have been, as everybody is aware, there have been cases of monkeypox outside of Africa. And what, you know, I think there's about just more than 1,500 cases that have been identified thus far. And if you're looking at those cases, they have been mainly in men who have sex with men. It is not, it does not mean it only gets transmitted through, you know, a man who have sex with men, but any direct contact. And the minister is correct in saying why we have seen this trend within, the men, within men who have sex with men. That's probably how it was originally, you know, introduced in these countries that are outside of Africa. Why are we talking about men who have sex with men? It is because, you know... Um, well, Nolwazi, that was public health expert, Professor Kolega Mlisana. Just talk to us about your thoughts on um, what she was trying to explain in that bite. It does seem that there is a conflation between monkeypox and sexuality. And she's raising statistical research as a reason for that conflation. But does it really make sense in today's contemporary landscape? Mm. I'm so sorry. Unfortunately, I didn't get the benefit of, of hearing the bite on my side here. Um, so I didn't hear the bite that you've just played. Um, so I can only speak specifically to the comments that were made, um, you know, during the, the announcement of the first reported case in South Africa, which were, in fact, uh, made in an irresponsible and reckless fashion. The NICD has uh, since uh, sub subsequently come out on their social media pages to say that um, they condemn any kind of, uh, you know, homophobic abuse and vitriol that has um, resulted on their social media space as a result of this announcement, but it's a little bit late. Um, history, in particular, if you think about the HIV AIDS pandemic in South Africa and globally, as well as the, um, a the attacks on Asian people that we began to see across the world uh, during um, the early stages of the COVID-19 pandemic tell us that people who work within the public health um, space and who are tasked with um, making such important announcements need to be mindful and careful about using a rights-based approach when they are communicating as it relates to pandemics of this nature and to ensure that their communication does not lead to profiling of marginalized communities, which the NICD, I think, failed at in this particular instance. Mm. Can you talk to us, Nolwazi, about the risk of using this kind of inflammatory language? Uh, we've heard from other public health experts talk about how it oftentimes makes it uh, very difficult to have individuals who form part of these uh, groups, these demographic groups, to actually come forward uh, with cases of whatever viral infection they may in fact be dealing with because of the stigma that's often associated uh, with that pathogen. So just talk to us about the risk that comes with using this kind of language. Well, there are a number of risks, in my opinion. I think the first thing that we need to note is generally that men who have sex with men um, and gay men tend to interact much more readily uh, and more regularly with the health system than um, cis het and, and heterosexual men would. Um, and, and so what this means is that it actually, ironically, would put men who are straight in a little bit more danger because because people would not want to be associated with homosexuality, they would then stay away from
from the health system as opposed to seeking help. That is the first, uh, uh, you know, concern. Obviously, our biggest concern at the at the moment is the ways in which this kind of of language um, will can be used. This kind of languaging can be used to perpetuate violence against uh, men who have sex with men and queer men within our community. Because the, part of the reason why we we refer to the LGBTQ community as a marginalized group or a marginalized community is because there's already an existing and perpetuating um, stigmatization and violence towards that community, and giving homophobic people yet another reason to be homophobic is a very dangerous place um, to place ourselves. But beyond that, one of the biggest risks, I think, for me, is the actual public health risk, because scientists have been very clear um, that monkeypox is not um, uh, transferred between people as a result of um, a sexual intercourse in the ways in which we understand it, for example, as happens with HIV AIDS, but the issue is in fact close physical contact, which has nothing to do with sexual orientation and very little to do with the sexual behavior um, that is queer specifically. And so if you begin to communicate um, that um, and men who have sex with men are the ones who are at highest risk when this is not in fact the case in terms of the ways in which the virus spreads. What you're doing is you're creating a situation where people who do not identify themselves as men who have sex with men will um, not take seriously the public health um, uh, things that they should be taking seriously in order to begin to curb the spread of the virus. Mm -hmm. I mean... When we look at the lessons, I suppose, that we learn from COVID-19, we know that in that instance, there was a racial dimension to some of the stigma that we saw uh, coming through uh, on COVID-19. Uh, and I wonder, because I, I suppose that begets the question if there's enough sort of training and sensitization that's happening within the public health sector, but perhaps we can go beyond that and extend that training and sensitization to the public in general uh, to say that, you know, even when you receive communication of this nature, um, from government uh, that we question, um, you know, its veracity and we question uh, whether or not the language being used here is appropriate. Yeah. So I think that there are a number of things, right? Uh, for me, the fact that there has been uh, the kind of backlash that I've seen in the past 24 hours as it relates to the statement that came from the public health specialist at the NICD shows that uh, there is a, a, a great deal of work that has been done and that the situation that we're in is not as dire as, um, you know, my, one might generally believe in these kinds of circumstances. But I absolutely do agree with you that it is important, it's an absolutely imperative um, that public health officials um, center what we call a rights-based approach in their communication as it relates to uh, uh, um, uh, pandemics and, and information of, 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 of this nature. Uh, you know, the NICD has since come out to say that that information was offered to, to give epidemiological um, uh, 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 context. And I think that they cannot communicate to a, a, a citizenry which is made up of people and only think about focusing um, on the science of the communication and why that, that would be important and not think about the social science of the ways in which they communicate things to the citizenry. And in terms of the information that the greater public needed to have from the NICD, I do not believe that, uh, that in the global north for very specific reasons, um, that most of the cases that have only been uh, identified cases, by the way, um, uh, involved more men, men who have sex with men. I do not think that there was information that had any kind of usefulness um, within our context. All right. Well, thank you so much, Nolwazi, for joining us this morning. That was Acting Co-Executive Director at Iranti, Nolwazi Tusini.